So I'm in it for life. I can't feel my face. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what we yeah. do. Yeah. We yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I told y'all. Shout out to Bird Pay attention. Yeah, straight up deep ball. 17th wall. Bitch Katrina turned my city to a seashore. I keep guard for them corns like me, y'all. They gon' eat the respect me all. He all. I feel your pain and I see your stress How they think your people supposed to get through Katrina off a FEMA check Coke in the Pyrex, dope in the ice, yes Mine on the highway, both sides right, left So, um, so what else? What, what, what are we looking for? What's the next phase of Weezy? I mean, what? Oh, uh, man, um, I can't feel my face. Me and Joel Santana, the mixtape, the album, the movie, the whatever really? else comes from it. We going big. Shout out Fleet Capo. Did you start this already? Um, the Can't Feel My Face album and mixtape has already been started. Um, actually, we like, we so full with the album. All we need is those, big, you know, those, name, those producers' names we know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That everybody else know. Because we got a gang of music from people that they don't know, but it's just, it's great. It's crazy. Now, me and Wayne, it's something that we've been working on, a project that we've been, we've been promoting the name. So, you know, me and Wayne, we, we actually talk. We decide it's a perfect time to get together. So, you know, we, we, we just piecing together the, the music that we already had that people ain't here, along with, you know, he sent me about eight new records. So, I can't feel my face. I'm, I'm tired of talking about it just like so. He said it's going to happen, so we're going to make it happen. Like, I just want to put it out. You know, it's a lot of politics. Like, me and Wayne is not a problem. We get the music done. That's never been a problem. You dig what I'm saying? It's just about, you know, it's a lot of politics when it comes to dealing with this industry. We got two labels, so we're going to push to really make it happen no matter what this time. Me and Wayne did about 45 records. So just as many records leaked before, we had still about 20 records that didn't get leaked. Now we're going to do about another probably... 20 to 30 records just to make sure the album is what it's supposed to be. You dig what I'm saying? And um, besides that, you know what you get from him, you know what you get from me. You, you, you got a little taste of what you get from us together, so you know what to expect, man. Little Wayne, a man that in my opinion, besides someone like Tupac, is one of, if not the most influential rappers of all time and definitely one of the best rappers of his era and had one of the craziest primes in rap history. His body of work and influence is nothing to scoff at. And I remember doing a poll some months back asking how many classic albums does Wayne have and if I can remember correctly what the poll results were, I can remember it being around three or four. But I think that the general consensus amongst his fans is that Mixtape Wayne was just a different breed. And if we want to combine how many mixtapes and classic albums he has, then that number could possibly be in the double digits. Then you have Juel Santana, who to me and many other people had all the tools to be a star in the rap game. He started off very, very young, and him along with Dipset really left their stamp on the culture with their movement. And one day, Juel Santana, the prince, was supposed to take over Cameron's spot as the quote-unquote leader of Dipset. You can say whatever about how his career turned out, but you cannot deny the talent he possessed in his prime and can't deny that he was a problem. I want you to think of who you think the hottest rapper in the game right now is and pair him with an up and comer that's definitely out here being a problem and is destined for greatness. This is essentially what Joel Santana and Lil Wayne were back in the day. Today, we will be breaking down Lil Wayne and Joel Santana's relationship along with the road to their collab album, I Can't Feel My Face, which the first talks of the project existed all the way back in 2006. So yeah, we're in 2021 and still haven't gotten it yet. Like, yo, that's just, that's just crazy. 
Also, fun fact, Joel said that Lil Wayne was the one who came up with the name, and I'm pretty sure he got it from the 2001 movie Blow, which stars Johnny Depp. And in a scene, a man says, I can't feel my face. This would make sense because Joel's and Wayne would have a mixtape later called Blow, but we're getting a little bit too far ahead of ourselves. Before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys can be doing a million other things right now, but instead, you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. I reply to a lot of the comments and I love going through them and seeing what you guys think. Also, follow my Instagram too, that would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love, like it's all good. Also, I recently hit 10k subs, so thank you guys so much, and thank just all my supporters, because I really, really appreciate that, and I thought that it would be cool if you guys can send me some questions for a potential Q&A that I'm thinking about doing. It can be about anything. Nothing too, too crazy for the weirdos out there. Like, nothing too crazy. But it can be questions about music, my inspirations, basic info about me and my life, etc. Whatever you really want to know about me. I need a lot of questions to make that Q&A video, and I only have a few. So give me some good ones. To get back to the point, let me know where you are tuning in from. Represent where you're from. Comment down below with your favorite Lil Wayne and Joel Santana track that we do have today. Without further ado, I give you Lil Wayne vs. Joel Santana. The story of I Can't Feel My Face. It seems like the first time there was reports that Wayne and Jewels was dropping the tape together appears to be back all the way in 2006. To paint the picture of where Jewels and Lil Wayne were at that time in their career, we'll start off with Jewels. At this point in the game, Jewels had already released two albums with his debut album From Me To You releasing in August of 2003, reaching number 8 on the Billboard 200 and selling 74,000 copies in its first week. He then released his sophomore album What The Game Has Been Missing in November of 2005, reaching number 9 on the Billboard 200, selling 141,000 copies in in its first week. Jewels also released some highly received mixtapes as well, with some like Final Destination and his Back Like Cook Crack series. We also had to remember, Jewels was super hot in 2005, because not only did his album that year went on to do pretty well, but Jewels was featured on Chris Brown's song Run It, which originally debuted at number 92 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. It took eight weeks to get into the top 10 of the chart, and I think a couple weeks after that, it eventually went on to be number one, and it stayed at number one for five straight weeks. As of today, the song is multi-platinum. We also can't forget, Jewels was on his run with Dipset as well, with the release of the first Dipset album, Diplomatic Immunity, in March of 2003, which peaked at number 8 on the Billboard 200, selling 92,000 copies in its first week. Week. Classic double disc album, by the way. And then the group had the release of their sophomore album, which was Diplomatic Immunity 2, which released in November of 2004. Dipset also had a bunch of mixtapes that they put out, but literally we'll be here all day if we're just going to just include them all. But you get the point. At this point, Jewels had success with Dipset and he had solo success with his albums and projects and was pretty much positioned to be that guy one day. He was known as the prince and one day was soon to be the king and by the time 2006 rolled around, he was one of the hottest things smoking if I'm not mistaken. Now we get to Wayne in 2006 and pretty much Wayne was already pretty much taken over if he hadn't already. But, side note, I think that the Carter 3 was when Wayne was undoubtedly the best rapper in the game. And it wasn't even close, but we'll get to that a little bit later. In June of 2004 is when Lil Wayne would start his legendary The Carter series and the album peaked at number 5 on the US Billboard 200, selling 116,000 copies in its first week. 
On this album, Lil Wayne would have the song Go DJ and it garnered him a lot of attention. And I mean like Lil Wayne was already known like before this point because like the Carter was his fourth solo studio album. But you also have to count his uh squad up days, then you gotta count like the hot boy days and stuff like that. But yeah, but Go DJ is when Lil Wayne like really really started getting on people's radars. The song was a huge, huge hit, and it was the biggest hit of his solo career at that time if I'm not mistaken with it reaching number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. Wayne would then turn around the next year in December of 2005 and drop the Carter 2 in which the album peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 200 selling 240,000 copies in its first week. On track number 7 on the album, Lil Wayne would declare himself the best rapper alive and actually on track 8, Joel Santana is featured on the song Lock and Load. Then the next year, album wise, Lil Wayne would release the Like Father Like Son album with Birdman which peaked at number 3 on the US Billboard 200 chart selling 176,000 copies in its first week. Now, we just briefly went through Album Wayne, but like I said in the beginning, there was a good amount of people who prefer Mixtape Wayne, which back then I cannot deny, he was absolutely on fire with the mixtapes. With his The Drought series, The Prefix, The Suffix, Had His Thing Was Squad Up, and at this point, the start of the Dedication series, in which Joel Santana appeared on two songs on Dedication 2, on Welcome to the Jungle and No Other, which was the intro song for this video. Also, fun fact, DJ Drama said Dedication 2 was so big, it ended up on the New York Times Top 10 Albums of the Year, and it was a mixtape. All right, this part was just to build up where Wayne and Jewels was at the time as individuals. So as you can see, by the time 2006 came around, Jewels and Wayne were both problems in the rap game. Wayne thought that he was the best rapper alive, which y'all can argue about if like he really, really was or not, but it definitely did turn out to be true later on if it already wasn't true. And by the time 2006 came around, Jewels was still very hot from his crazy year in 2005 and still was perceived as the next biggest thing. All right, let's get into the next part of the video where we'll focus more on Jewels and Wayne as a duo. So I really tried to pinpoint when exactly Lil Wayne and Jewels first met and all that good stuff, but in pretty much all of the articles I read and the videos I watched, I really couldn't find anything at all. If you know, then please comment down below because the only thing that I really managed to find is that Cameron had Birdman on the Old Boy remix all the way back in 2002. So maybe this is when all of them first met, but I don't really know. I really wish that I could do these interviews myself so I can find out these kind of things. But one thing that we do know is that if you're familiar with Dipset, then you know that Dipset was really, really messing with the South back in the day. They mess with people from pretty much every coast and that's why I hate when people say that Dipset are only really big in New York which is complete cap because I've had a bunch of people in my comments from places like in the south saying that they were really really messing with Dipset back in those days and even now. There was just this stigma about southern rappers back in the day and even now but Dipset was one of the first to really really bridge the gap between those two coasts specifically because artists had done it before but Dipset had a bunch of tracks with southern artists and they were tight with quite a few of them. Fun fact, Cameron actually introduced Lil Wayne to Young Jeezy which I thought was actually really really cool and I don't know if a lot of people know that. But anyways, what we do know is that Lil Wayne spent a summer with Dipset. About this, Jim Jones, a member of Dipset said, Well Wayne spent the whole summer with us. We spent the whole summer with Jewels pretty much. He just adapted all the styles. He pretty much knew what he was doing. He knew what he needed and stuff like that to persevere in this game. And that was to be able, you know, to get an identity shift and stuff like that. That's what he did and stuff like that, you dig? They had a different way of moving and dressing coming from the South and him being blood to correlation affiliation. Us being very drippy and stuff like that, it was natural. It happens like that. Most people that hang around us end up moving in one accord and stuff like that, which is not a bad thing. If I was around some dudes like us, I would try to move like that too. These dudes looking kind of smooth. They fly, they gangsters, you know what I mean? About this, we would ultimately see a style change in Lil Wayne. 
I've seen people say in my comments that around this time period, people could notice a change in Lil Wayne both in the style and how he rapped. Somewhere around the summer of 2006 to 2007, Jim Jones was the one who really, really catapulted this rock star style in hip hop, which I don't think that he gets the credit he deserves for it. I remember seeing this thing on Instagram one day and it had a picture of Kanye West and Jim Jones and it asked who had the most influential swag or style and on Jim Jones page pretty much everybody was saying Jim Jones which is like very very understandable it's his page but I can't really I don't really like know where but I saw like it was posted on another page and like pretty much people were saying the opposite and I remember a bunch of people were discrediting Jim Jones and writing him off which to me is just like super duper nonsense. We're all pretty familiar with Kanye's fashion, I'm pretty sure, but if you want to know more about Jim Jones and how he breaks down Kanye's fashion at least, then I would recommend that you go check out his episode on Complex Brackets because Jim Jones really was speaking some facts on that episode. Jim Jones brought out the tattered shirts, rock and roll shirts, them flashy bling belts, jeans with the chains on them, and so much more. He even gave credit to Kid Cudi really starting it because fun fact, Kid Cudi worked at this rock and roll store under Koch Records, which at the time of these events, Jim Jones was under and Kid Cudi would sell him those things. I say all this to say that we would see Lil Wayne start dressing like this around this era and Jules was rocking the same stuff as well. Wayne was repping Dipset super heavy. And when I mean heavy, like that's like that's a complete understatement. On his mixtape, The Jout 3, Lil Wayne has a song literally called Dipset. And in that song, he says that he's so Dipset and he is claiming Dip South. The Drought 3 was in 2007, but let's go all the way back to 2006 when the Lil Wayne and Joel Santana collab album was originally brought to people's attention. In 2006, Lil Wayne and Joel Santana would drop the project Blow with Mick Boogie. I think that's how you say it, Mick Boogie. So some more information on this, I just read a Billboard article that was released a month after Blow was released and Jewels said that the mixtape leaked and now there was a big demand for what will become I Can't Feel My Face. Well, in 2008, things would get a little bit more complicated because Lil Wayne would release the Carter 3, which was monstrous. This man, Lil Wayne, had an opening date opening day sales of 423,000 copies just the opening day the Carter 3 would obviously peak at number one on the US Billboard 200 chart selling over a million copies in its first week its first week sales was the largest first week sales for any album in 2008 in the United States and the first album to reach the million mark in one week since 50 Cent's The Massacre in 2005. Lil Wayne also had a number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 with Lollipop, number six song with The Millie, number 10 song with Got Money, number 62 song with Mr. Carter, and number 16 song with Miss Officer. So yeah, safe to say Lil Wayne was that guy. <laughs> Also, Jewels did appear on the album on the song, You Ain't Got Nothing. Joel Santana, in an old interview with DJ Vlad, said that with this success, Lil Wayne was in a different place that he was in before, and he was moving different. Jewels himself said that he was on his grind because Joel just got out of his situation with his label, but then he said that the I Can't Feel My Face album was pretty much done. But in the same interview with DJ Vlad, Joel said that the project between him and Wayne was pretty much done and they had upwards of 35 records ready to go. The only thing that was holding them back wasn't Wayne or Joel's because they were all for it. But Joel's broke it down to the politics of Wayne and Joel's being on different labels and so many people that you had to get on the same page. Joel said that at that time, Cameron was very, very involved in his situation and at that time that they weren't on the best of terms. And I think that Joel's was referring to Wayne before the Carter 3 because he also breaks it down to Wayne not being as big of an artist to where he can just take over and demand that they drop the project. This was said in an interview with DJ Vlad in 2013, but referring back to the one that Jewels did in 2008, he said that another issue was that the stuff from the project was getting leaked. In that interview, he said that two tracks were leaked in the past two weeks of him doing that interview, 
Not even like back in the day because like Lil Wayne has been getting his music leaked for years. I think that the most notable Wayne leak is the leak that occurred before the Carter 3, which was a big deal. But yeah, now we get to late 2008 to 2009, and now there's rumors of a different collab album with Lil Wayne, but instead it isn't with Joel Santana, and instead this one was with T-Pain. Now, I Can't Feel My Face was still on, but I think that it's notable to mention the T. Wayne project because it would end up suffering a similar fate to I Can't Feel My Face because this project wouldn't come out for years. Another sort of delay for the I Can't Feel My Face album was when Wayne pleaded guilty to attempted criminal possession of a weapon, which stemmed from a 2007 incident when police found a pistol in his possession. In March of 2010, Wayne was sentenced to one year in prison, which he served at Rikers Island, and in November of that year, after serving eight months in his one-year sentence, Wayne was released. Now we can go to 2012, and there was news that I Can't Feel My Face was scrapped. In an interview, Lil Wayne said, I actually got at Jewels when I got out of jail and told him, man, I think it's time we really capitalize on that. Now he can't work how he wants to work because they shut down his studio. I sent him some music and he didn't send them back in the time fashion that I worked. I started putting extra verses on those songs and I've moved on. Now what probably would have been I Can't Feel My Face has turned into I Am Not A Human Being too. With this, Wayne is explaining how in 2011, police raided Joel Studio in New Jersey. They found guns, weed, and even took three hard drives, and yeah, it was a big deal. Besides the legal situation, Joel said that him losing his studio put a sour taste in his mouth. Pause. I just... <laughs> pause on that pause <laughs> but he said that he was spoiled having his own studio but now that he didn't have it anymore like it just was a difference because like it's just a difference when you're recording out of a studio that isn't yours you have a time limit you gotta pay for it and it just feels like you're in a rush versus having your own where you can do pretty much like whatever you want to do so this is probably why g wells didn't give him the verses back in time Despite this, everything between the two still appeared to be good, and Joel still wanted Wayne to executive produce his mixtape God Willing, which released in January of 2013, and it was Joel's first solo project since, like, I don't even know, like 2006? Little Wayne would appear on the track Blackout off of that mixtape. Alright, this will end this segment of this video where I pretty much talked about the story behind the project I Can't Feel My Face and why it was delayed again, again, and again. This last part is where I'll discuss the latest events surrounding this project and the possibility if it will ever see the light of day. After 2013, Lil Wayne and Jewels appeared on some tracks together. They appear together on the songs Bloody Mary and boiling water, to name a few. Throughout the years, there was always talks of what if this I Can't Feel My Face album came out when it was supposed to, and if it got released, who would care? In 2017, when the T. Wayne project dropped, talks of the tape between Wayne and Jewels got brought up again because T. Wayne went through something similar, but it didn't have that same hype as I can't feel my face and it just feels like if it ever came out we would never know what we were getting. I think that in my opinion we'll get new songs mixed in with old ones but like man like I think that we all know 2021 Jewels and Wayne aren't the same no more. Wayne and Jewels are still legendary in their own rights. Don't get it twisted by any means but they just don't have that same hunger back like they did in 2006. 2007, 2008. They can both still deliver a great verse in my opinion, but I think people really want to hear the unreleased old stuff, and I'm thinking they should just load this project up with a bunch of songs if they ever release it, because for one, the wait, but they already have an abundance of music we haven't heard, and then there's stuff we've already heard but probably want on the tape. In 2020, talks of this tape got talked about again and reports were saying it was supposed to drop in that summer. Joelle's wife went on The Breakfast Club and confirmed that I Can't Feel My Face was in the final stages. Joelle Santana's brother slash manager, Twin, said that they had a whole 25 songs that were ready to go and that they already spoke to Lil Wayne. At this time, Joelle's was serving a 27-month 
prison sentence stemming from a March 2008 incident at the Newark Liberty International Airport where the rapper tried to enter a terminal checkpoint with a loaded 38 caliber handgun and eight oxy pills in his bag. Jewels was supposed to get out that summer according to his wife. Jewels will be set free in August of 2020 but no project between him and Wayne. Then in early 2021, Talk to the Project came up again when rapper Uncasa, who was in Dipset along with Jewels, said in an interview that Wayne and Jewels were reworking the project. At that point, Uncasa said that he wasn't privy to the new material, but he was around for every moment of the recording of the original I Can't Feel My Face project. He talked about how Jewels and Wayne only did a few songs in the same studio and that pretty much the whole project was coming through emails. Jewels would do a verse and hook, then send it back to Wayne. Wayne, no longer than half an hour later, would send him some stuff back in an email. Uncasa also told a story about how on the day Wayne found out the Carter 3 went platinum in a week, he sent two songs back to Joel Santana for Skull Gang that never ended up coming out. This doesn't surprise me because Wayne is known for being a workaholic and I remember DJ Khaled saying something like Lil Wayne recorded 12 features in like one session. Which is just like, yo, that just further proves that Lil Wayne is a freaking alien, like. But now it's July of 2021 and still no project. So I'm leaving you guys with some questions. Will this project ever come out? Do you even care if it will ever come out? Me personally, I still want to hear it and I'm going to listen to it if it ever drops. I hope that it does drop because like the fans have been waiting forever and we know that the music is there and both Jewels and Lil Wayne seem like they want to release it but the business just has to be right and everyone around them has to be on the same page. This pretty much wraps up the video though. Tell me what you guys think in the comments. I'm out.